if anyone has any questions about the Rebbe, Nelson, the rest of what it's all about, whatever. I want to ask a question before we start. <coughs> was Reb Nasser a part of Yeshua? Was he one like Reb Nachman to do? Reb Nachman called him Yeshua. My Yeshua, my Yeshua. Like Moshe Rabbeinu had a Yeshua, Reb Nasser was to Reb Nachman like that Yeshua. Like Moshe because oil, he never left. Rabbi Nachman's tent, Rabbi Nachman's uh, towering figure over him. He always stayed there. That's how he became Rabbi Nossam, a towering figure unto himself. Because he stayed with Rabbi Nachman all the time. Actually, somebody asked me to ask you a question, just fact-checking, since you're the expert on Reb Nassim. Oh, oh um, wow. Is it true that Reb Nassim was trying to be Makar himself to some other tzaddikim after the Rebbe passed away? That's what I heard. Specifically, maybe the Kotzka? Is that I don't know. No, uh, he met the Kotzka. A few years before he passed away. Not the Koska, the Tzanza. The Tzanza, okay. He met him a few years before he passed away. But um, yeah, I heard that, the shame of Gedalia Kenneth, that that first year after the Rebbe passed away, the Rebbe, Rebbe Nelson was looking for the Tzanza. Who's the Tzadik now? And um, he went to various Tzadikim to see if they would be the tzaddik. It's not written in your name on that or something? Uh -huh. It doesn't mention no. that? This is a very controversial, I won't say controversial, it's very, <coughs> it's a very uh, questionable, I, I could feel that it's right. I can feel, you know, it's just uh, you feel it, it's right or not. Nelson looks for, for the tzaddik. Because with Nelson, the Rebbe, in Lesson 61, the Rebbe speaks about there are people who are great tzaddikim and they don't have faith in themselves. And I can imagine with Nelson not feeling that he could take over the helm of what the Rebbe started. So I could see Reb Nossam, or I could understand that Reb Nossam would, uh, would shy away from taking over the mantle of leadership of what the rest of Hasidus is all about. In Yemeg Maranat, he does write that uh, I was there, and it was about a year after the Rebbe passed away, and I realized that it depends on me. <coughs> That's what Rub Nelson writes in Yimei Mana. That he went to others. I heard it, Bishem Rub Gidal And um, I could imagine it happening. I can't say for sure it happened. Right? It's, I haven't heard it or seen anything I've about seen it. it. I've seen it written somewhere. In the book Fire and Water, you read it? Yes. That's where you saw it. That was the first time that ever found print. I didn't bring my bow tie. Oh, oh. You're excused. <laughs> Just because you can't get it first or second showers. So yeah. You have a special waiver. Did Rebbe Nachman want Rebbe Nachman to set it up the way he did, meaning that there would be no real quote Rebbe, and that in the future there would only be Rebbe Nachman? Rebbe Nachman 
Well, Rabbi Nachman kind of gave Shlicha. You know, not the Shlicha that we know it today, but he crowned Rabbi Nachman as his Talmud carry on the torch. Shimmy told me something. I saw him Shabbos. The trip was the way it was. When I came back, people told me stories of what I did and how I snuck in and how I did. <laughs> Millions of things they told me, things that I never heard of. So don't worry about it. You're not the first. <laughs> Reb Nussin was imbued with a knowledge and understanding of Reb, N- of Reb Enuzal, Rabbi Nachman, more so than anyone else. And his understanding of Rabbi Nachman is what made him remain a student and not become a Rebbe after him. In the Chaim Aran is a small sicha, short sicha, shouldn't say small, short sicha, where Rebbe Nezal talks about the Baal Shem Tov, and he said the Baal Shem Tov started something, but it petered out. The other tzaddikim, his talmidim, told us, the Magad of Mizraj, others, they started something, but it petered out. Right? I want to make something that will continue. That my talmidim should make more talmidim. And their talmidim should make other talmidim. Right? Notice this was not Borshtein point out in a lecture once. He said, notice that the Rebbe said, Talmidim, not Rebbe. Whereas what happened in all the other Hasidus that there became, well, we need a Rebbe, and you become the Rebbe, and you become the, the new guy. And no. Reb Nossin, he writes this in the Kutei Allah, Zichol Shluchim. He writes about how the Tzaddik, the main thing about the Tzaddik is his Torah and how his Torah lists. The Torah is alive by you. It's Rashi in this week's parsha. <coughs> it shows you the greatness of Reb Nossim. But the Tzaddik gave over his Torah. As long as you accept the Torah of the Tzaddik and you follow through with the Torah of the Tzaddik, then you, uh, then you feel the tzaddik is still being alive. He's never dead. Look at the box. Right? Well, they're the only ones I know who follow. You know, Breslau. I would say the Breslau pattern. The right. Only, that's the only Hasidus that I know. Maybe there's others, but in several hundred years, it's the only one I'm aware of. The others are getting a, a wind of it because they. The Rebbe passes away, take a look at Bubba. You know, the kids are fighting over who's in charge, told the Sarah has it, or not. Eventually, they'll all get to that understanding. Right? They all have money, they all have a reason to fight. Huh? They all have money, they have a reason to fight. The rest of them have no money. <laughs> There's enough fighting going on without the money. But did Reb not, is this what Reb Nachman wanted, a pattern? Is this what he desired? I can't tell you. I never I met him in the nice. flesh but, I mean, to in, ask him if this is what writing, he wanted or not. Do we have any indication of that in his writings? Or not really? No. Not that I know of. So it sounds like this is unique to Reb Nachman's personality. Would need a personality, yes. 
Yes. Can you talk about it now? Okay. Show them. It's good. It's a good way to start the evening, okay? If anyone is familiar with uh, this week's parsha, it's a very interesting uh, Rashi based on the Gemara and Tainus. But yes, of Yaakov Raglov El Amita, Yaakov gathered his feet onto his bed. By Yigva, and he passed on. By Yosef Elamah. That he was gathered unto his, his soul was gathered up. And Rashi points out, it's the Gemara and Tainus, that uh, <coughs> Misa lo nema boy, doesn't say Yaakov of Inu Doi. Viyamu Rabbaseinu, Yaakov of Inu lo mes. Yaakov of Inu not Doi. Okay? Now the Gemara asks, but they eulogized him, they embalmed him, and they buried him. What do you mean he didn't die? Huh? Well, the Gemara there says, I think it was Nachman Bar Yitzchok, he says, Lo, Mikra Ani Darish. This is what the Gemara says. I'm quoting you from a Pesach. The Pesach says, right, I'm going to gather in Yaakov, Right? And B'nai Yisrael <coughs> says, Ma'hem b'chayim, af Yaakov b'chayim. That's what the Gemara says. I'm not doing it from Seichel, from understand. I'm doing it, Apostle says, Yaakov's children are alive, Yaakov is still alive. That's what the Gemara says. The Zoya says the same thing. Yaakov avinu l'mes. Then the Zoya says, not only just Yaakov Avinu, but all the tzaddikim, they don't die. So the Zoya right away asks, so the Zoya at the end of Pasha's Truma, Vayomos Shom Moshe, Evid Hashem, what do you mean, yeah, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't die? It says he died. Right? What does it mean? The Zoya answers, Misitra Dilon. From our side, it's considered as if he died. From his side, there's no death. Okay? This is what it says about the tzaddik. So, is Rabbi Nachman alive today? He's a Torah. Oh? He's alive through his Torah. He's alive through his Torah, but he's alive. Or is he dead? Right? Huh? Well, he's more well known. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. So let's take Reb Nossin. Reb Nossin is more ridiculous. And he brings the Rashi at the end of Pasha's Vayelach. Moshe Rabbeinu says to Kla Yisrael, Ki Adati. After I die, you're all going to go off the path. Rashi quotes the Medrash. I'm saying where Rashi says it to make it easier for you to look it up if you want. You don't have to go look at all of the portion. But the Medrash says, what do you mean, after I die? The Pasuk says, People served Hashem, call you may Yehoshua. Yahweh the Omis Hashem, call you may Yehoshua. For call you may as Canaan, Hashem Erichu Yomim Achrei Yehoshua. So for a couple of generations, the people did not go off the path. What did Moshe Rabbeinu mean by saying, after I die, you're going to go off the path? Right? Says Rashi. Calls man she tamido shalom kayam as long as the student of a tamid of, of a tzaddik is alive, 
it's considered as if that tzaddik is alive. Right? Clear? Any questions on that? Yeshua and his Canaan. Reb Nelson says, take a look. What is the real value of a tzaddik? You can go see him in the flesh. Nice. You can go ask from him advice. Nice. Right? You can go eat his shirayim at a tish. Nice. But is that what the tzaddik is there for? Or the tzaddik is to teach you how to serve Hashem. How to use your strengths and power to serve Hashem. So that the main part of the tzaddik is the teachings of the tzaddik, the Torah of the tzaddik. That is the most important thing of the tzaddik. And when his teachers live on, the tzaddik lives on. If we fulfill the Torah, so the Rebbein Azal is very alive, very much so. Same thing with all the tzaddik, the Beis Yosef, the Rosh Shulchan Aruch, the Gemara, says uh, the Roman Emperor said to Rabbi Yeshua, I'm bigger than Moshe Rabbeinu. He says, why? Because he's dead, I'm alive. Rabbi Yeshua says to them, could you decree that nobody lights a fire for three days? He says, yeah. He decreed nobody could light a fire in the city of Rome for three days. That evening, Rabbi Yeshua takes him up on the mountainside and he sees smoke coming out of someone's house. He goes down to the house. He says, you deserve the death penalty. I, as king, decreed that nobody should light a fire. And uh, here you lit the fire. He says, what can I do? My wife is very sick. She needs hot water. And if I didn't cook the water, so uh, she'd be dead. So I had to light the fire. Rabbi Yeshua says to him, <coughs> You made a decree. One day, you couldn't. People couldn't stand with that decree. They violated your decree. Moshe Rabbeinu decree: don't light a fire on Shabbos a few thousand years ago, and nobody lights a fire. The tzaddik is alive. Reb Nosson understood that. Reb Nosson's greatness in the Avner Basel it's brought that. Rabbi Nachman had some very, very great tzaddikim. Rabbi Yudel was older than him, and he was a makubal when he came to Rabbi Nachman. And others were like that. Others, Rabbi Yudel was the name, was his name. Rabbi Yudel of uh, Medvedek. And uh, there were others like Rabbi Yudel, who were older than Rabbi Nachman, and they came to be students of Rabbi Nachman. And uh, they could have been maybe Rebbe's unto themselves, but what's written there in the Avnel Basel is that these Sadiqim, who were Rabbi Nachman's students, they well, Rabbi Nachman is, is a great, he's my Rebbe. But they retained a little bit of their own understanding of how to serve Hashem. Rabbi Nosson, when he became a Talmud, says, he is somebody who's so great, I am nothing. He put aside his entire learning, his entire understanding, and with that, he was able to receive more of Rabbi Nachman than anyone else. Rabbi Nosson, when he came to Rabbi Nachman, knew entire Shas, Shulchan Aruch, it's Russian. He knew it all. He was 22. He knew it all. But he put all his understanding aside. What Rabbi Nachman gives me, now I have a little das. Now he gives me a little more, now I have a little bit more das. Everything is based on Rabbi Nachman. And that's how Rabbi Nachman was able to pull out the 
teachings of the Rebbe and how he was able to make Brest of Hasidus today. What we have today in Brest of Hasidus is all due to Rav Are there any questions on this? Any other questions on Rav Huh? Why is it I have a hearing loss? I should be wearing my earrings, hearing aids, but I'm not. Okay, go ahead. Why is it that when a person says something, it's considered as blessed? He was not a nachman himself. No. So why is it every word that he said considered as blessed? Because what he took from Rabbi Nachman. Whatever he had himself be, was all due to Rabbi Nachman. It's all like an extension of Rabbi Nachman. It's the tzaddik who taught and the student who learned. But what is the learning of the student if not the tzaddik? Okay? When Yeshua got up to speak, if the Moshe Rabbeinu passed away, everybody knew that whatever Yeshua is saying came from Moshe Rabbeinu. They never questioned. They never questioned Yeshua. Is this what Moshe Rabbeinu said? Is this is what he wanted? That never happened. <coughs> you also have it in Gemara, in a sense. But the Gemara is in Yavomus, a few other places. Mur says that somebody once said a halacha and didn't mention Rabbi Yochanan, the Rebbe, the master of the Shmuel. And Rabbi Yochanan was very angry. Mur says, Ikpit. He says, why was he makpit? Because he's supposed to say something over a Shmuel in somebody else's name, and it's a source of Dugan's Right? So one of his Talmidim said, but everybody knows whatever he says is in your name anyway. Right? It's all you. And with that, he was placated. Tomorrow you vote, right? It's how the vote if you want to check it out. Okay? So there, why everything Reb Nelson says is Rebbe Nachman, that's Brest. It is Brest. You're always challenging me, yes, sir. To be a challenge. Not every day, yeah. Believe it, man. Yes, sir. How far along is the translation of the Kudi Halakot? Not very far. But Baruch Hashem, we found the template that we could work with. We had maybe 12 to 15 trials of how it would work. We finally found a, a way that the Lakut HaLochus can come out. So we have a couple of pieces translated already, but it's really the beginning. There's going to still be trial and error, but we hope uh, by the summer we'll have uh, a volume. We hope so. We hope so. If anyone wants to support it, it's even better. How far along is the Hebrew translation of the English to put The Hebrew translation? No, oh, we're almost finished with the first part, the Kutimaran, the whole Chay the You have to volume. Volume tests. Yeah. We're up to volume tests. What happened is the fellow who was doing the major work of it lived in Amona. Amona is a village in the. Yehuda in Shomron, which the government decided it belongs to the Arabs. So they threw everybody out of the village of Amona. And he was forced, to, and right after that, his wife broke her pelvis. So she couldn't work and move for a few months. So we've had a lot of minias and whatever. Uh, it's something that we are used to. We invest in research. We understand that uh, 
we have a major enemy that tries to stop us from doing our work. His name is Satan. And we're dealing with the top general, right? And we've had this many times before in our nearly 40-year history, of bringing out the Rebbe's firm. I should write a book, I'm not going to, but I should write a book on all the Meneas that we had, right? We brought this book to press, the printing press broke, <laughs> right? We brought this back, finally we got it printed, the binding broke, and the, or the sewing machine broke, or the this broke, or the that broke, or one after the other, uh, something that we're used to, right? And because we're now finishing the first part, the Kutu Moran, it's a bigger opposition, so... That would be which volume? Volume test. Test, for final page. Nine. The, the, last, the, the last will be three, three more volumes, we're hoping. To complete the whole thing. And, but again, you have to have people who could work. The guy is a good worker. He does the job right. The Hebrew is correct. Things work properly. So we're going to stay with him. But we have to work with him too. Like he has to work with us. <coughs> we have to work with him. So, ask me. Holy the Melissa. This week, you know, on, on one of the groups, they've been passing around the picture, which is just very inspiring every time you think about it. What Reb Nossin's specialty was, there's a little video going around of what was said to be one of Reb Nossin's uh, watches, like, a, you know, a chain watch, one of these uh, clocks given to him by, by his Talmud that says, Isaac, uh, by some... Uh, Don't Isaac, remember, by I never saw the picture or something. But, uh, Maybe tell us a little bit how he utilized every second of his life. I mean, I know that's, that was his special. Tov Kif Tzadik Tess, yeah, it was given to him in Shnaz Tov Kif Tzadik Tess. Could be. I don't, I don't know the story, so I can't tell you. No, not the story about that particular clock, just the whole... The Rebbe Reb Zusha of Anapoli, one of the greatest Tzadikim that ever lived, said, I am prepared to give an accounting before Hashem for every single day of my life. I'm prepared, except for a day of travel, except for a day when he traveled. Because in travel, as I know, you know, nothing ever goes the way you expect it to go, whatever. Reb Nelson said, when he heard that statement from Reb Zusha, he says, I am prepared to give an accounting for my life, even on a day of travel, even for a day of travel. The Shach, Shulchan Aruch, the Shach was awesome. He wrote a tremendous amount. He was 42 when he passed away. So it's not as if he had 60, 70 years to write. He was 42. And he wrote a tremendous amount and they asked, how was he able to write that amount? He said, because he had hashpa'as hakumas, the pen, the quill that he used, right? And remember, in those days, they didn't have a computer or even a ballpoint pen or even a pen with ink. They used to have a quill to dip into the inkwell every few letters in order to be able to write. And the Shach said that he had Ashbaas Hakumas. He made the quill, took it with an oath, a shvua, that it should move. So he was able to write quickly and whatnot. Reb Nelson said, if you ask how I was able to do what I did, <coughs> it's because
because I guarded every second of my life. Every second was dear to me, and I made sure that I utilized it. Every second. Reb Nelson, when he came to the Rebbe, realized that life is very precious, and he uh, took upon himself never to sleep more than four hours a night. Never to sleep more than four hours a night. And he did whatever he could. The nights he stayed up all day. The Chirina Rav writes in the Akdama to all of the Trufa, Reb Nossin's letters. He said, if anyone ever saw the way Reb Nossin davened in the morning, you would think that all his energy was put into davening. But if you ever looked at him during the day when he said till him, you would think that all Reb Nossin did was spend his energy and time in saying till him. But if you ever saw Reb Nossin sitting and learning, you would think that all Reb Nossin did was sit and learn. But if you ever saw Reb Nossin writing letters to his Talmidim and his son, Reb Yitzchok, you, know, you would think that all Reb Nossin did was stand and sit and write the whole day. If you ever saw Reb Nossin composing his tefillahs, or writing his chidushim, you would think that's all he ever did. And if he ever saw Reb Nossin speaking to people, giving them his chaskas and his servers and how to come close to Hashem, you would think that's how he spent all his time. So now we just listed, I think, 18 things that Reb Nossin did that you would think that every one of them has spent all his time on that. And he did every one of those things every single day. The Rebbe told him you should be mechadesh every single day. And he said it was difficult. There were times that it flowed. There were times that I had to squeeze it out of my tiny pinky. I had to squeeze out a chiddush. But I squeezed it. I got it. He said, the man was awesome. He writes that every second that you lose is lost. You ever hear of the expression killing time? Did you? You got some time to kill? Did you ever hear that? Right? Whose life are you killing if not your own? You're killing time. It's your life. Reb Nelson was careful not to lose a second. Everything he did was with Dvekis to Hashem. Right? Hashem is infinite. Hashem could provide those infinite koiches for you to be able to utilize every second of your day. <coughs> Who created time? Hashem. It's a Gemara and Chagiga. The 24-hour days that we know were created the first day of creation. For so that time is from Hashem. If you realize that blessing that we have, the time that comes to us from Hashem, then we know that we have tremendous koichas and we can really accomplish a tremendous amount every single day. That was Rabbi Right? That was Reb Nossin, right? I know when I wrote through fire and water, so I had to write the book. It's a biography. When I did it, I felt I was living with Reb Nossin every single day, because I was. I, mean, I had to take the subject, which is Reb Nossin, and put it down on paper and work it out that it's right and this is correct and this is, you know, it has a source or whatnot. So I did all that. And the days that I worked on the book, I was there in the office quite early and I worked through the day. 
and they didn't go home, they didn't go out of the office except davening or whatever. <coughs> I would take a bite maybe, but I wrote the whole day. The only reason I went home at night was because I couldn't focus on the screen anymore. Everything was blurry. So I went home to sleep, I slept, I came back in the morning. It was like when you're living with Reb Nossin, you can't waste time. Yeah. The book was written in four months. Wow. Right? From when I started writing the book till I finished, four months. You can't waste time with Reb Nossin. You can't. It's automatic. Right? Imagine the research leading up to those four months. That it's... took a year. <laughs> <laughs> that took a year. I would do it on my travels, not during what I was working on, but when I would be on a plane or a train or wherever I was, I would have one of the Sfarim with me, and I would highlight, this belongs in a biography, this belongs in a The book finally came out. It's in now, it's in English, in Hebrew, in Spanish, French, and we just uh, completed the translation into Russian. And uh, what we need are two things. One is financing for the balance of it, but also we need the time to the editing and moving the book. <coughs> but it's ready to come out. You know, maybe a year in the French and Spanish is published already? Yeah. What was the biggest design that Nelson had? What was the biggest Nisoyen of Reb Nossam? It's hard to say. There were quite a few. Quite a few. One of them would certainly be in the beginning of his his covers to the Rebbe. Reb Nossam was born into a Litvisha family, a Snagid family. When he got married at the age of 13, his father-in-law was Reb David Tzvi Orbach, who was considered one of the greatest poiskim of that generation, a tremendous goy. He was also a misnagger. <coughs> and uh, Reb Nossam felt he's missing something in life. So he started looking and searching and he went to various Hasidim, various uh, Rebbes, various Sadiqim. And uh, the Batich of Arav was one of them. He saw Talmidim of the Rebbe of Zusha, that he saw they, they made a bracha with such kavona. He says, how do you get that kavona? Right? That was Nosson. He was jealous that they had this kavona and this feeling of the Rebbe, uh, of their Rebbe, of, of Hashem. Remotra of not Neskus. Remotra of Kremenitz was one of the very big tzaddikim. His father was a very close Talmud of the Balshemtov. And he went, he started traveling to these Hasidim, to these Rebbes, to these tzaddikim. And he felt improvement. <coughs> but it didn't speak to him that this is where my life, how I'll be able to change. The Rebbe, when his Talmidim came to him, they first came, the Rebbe said to them, confess. The rest of them called the Vidanikas. Confess before me. So they were a joke by all the other Sadiqs by all the other Hasidim. And when Reb Nossin came to, uh, <coughs> came to the Rebbe, he came to Breslau, now Reb Dovid Tzvi, who's one of the greatest Sadiqim in the generation, has to live with a son-in-law, Vidinika, <coughs> a confessor, you know, Breslau, what's going on here? It was very hard for him. And he had a lot of opposition. 
Eventually, his father threw him out of the house. Threw him literally. In those days, no, his father. In those days, his father was also a Mustagir. In those days, he got married. He lived in your parents' house or your in-laws' house. Right? He lived in his parents' house. His father was wealthy. He had room for him. Everything was fine. His wife was demanding a divorce. And his father-in-law was passing through. Reb Nelson was already kicked out of the house. <coughs> and uh, his wife was demanding a divorce because she didn't marry a husband. She married a Musnaga. Right? But you see, there's a, a drop of emis by everybody. Sometimes you even realize it. Winston Churchill used to say that everybody stumbles over the truth. 98% of the people pick themselves up and keep on going. <laughs> yeah? Even the guy said something like that. The Gemara says, <laughs> So that was his father-in-law came to town to number of where Reb Nosson was because he was the chief rabbi of that whole area. So he passed through the town. And his wife started, Reb Nosson's wife complained. What do I do with a husband like this? So he asked her, is he still learning? I see them didn't learn in those days, right? <laughs> is he still learning? She answered, he learns double treble what he used to learn before. Reb David Tzvi, Zechorin of the Rocha, heard that, and he said, by such a husband, you want Parnosa? You should sit in the marketplace and sell salt, but bring him Parnosa so he can sit and learn more. And that's how the starter, some of the Machlikas went down. Reb Nosson stayed during that period at his grandfather's house, <laughs> Eventually, his father made a certain kind of parnasa where Reb Nosson would have money for it, and Reb Nosson lived on that for about eight years until his father's business went bankrupt. But uh, that was one of the biggest nisyonis. He came to the Rebbe again and again and again. The Rebbe said to him, to you we have to say, Shalom Aleichem Tzeschem L'Shalom. He says, as soon as you come, you better get home because there's trouble, you know. <laughs> Sorry. So that was uh, Reb Nelson's early year or two when he was by the Rebbe. Very, very big Nisoyim. But I don't know if that was his biggest Nisoyim. He went through uh, call it a living hell when he uh, went through the years of oppression. He may have lois. Reb Nelson went through four years of uh, terrible oppression from the different Hasidim, especially the uh, Savrana Rebbe at that time. But uh, they wanted to kill Reb Nelson. They hired someone to kill him. He killed a different Reb Nelson in town. I mean, he killed, he did kill somebody else who was named Nelson. <laughs> they tried to get the authorities to banish Reb Nelson to Siberia. <coughs> and they did a lot of other things like that. Reb Nelson still remained steadfast in his work in the Rebbe's thing. Reb Nelson said, in a way, it's a shame we don't have any money. If I had 10,000 rubles, I would buy up the government and these guys would not touch me. But uh, he didn't have... But uh, they went against Reb Nelson. They tried to bury him. They tried to kill him. They tried to banish him. And Reb Nelson said, my only Eitzah is tefillah is to pray to Hashem for Yeshua. God forbid that I should be the Roydev and not, and not the Nirdav. Nirdav, the, the Medrash and Emmer, Parshas Emmer says, is a pasuk in Kohelis, Elikim Yivakesh es Nirdav. Hashem seeks the one who is pursued. So the, the Medrash there says, 
I can understand if a Russia pursues a tzaddik. I can understand if a Russia pursues a Russia. But what if a tzaddik pursues a Russia? What if the tzaddik pursues a tzaddik? He says, understand, says the Medrash, that Elikim Yivakesh is Nirdov. Hashem always seeks the one who is pursued. The Medrash there is talking about why Shor or Kesef or Ez Ki Yivoled. What animals are accepted on the Vizpeach? An ox, a sheep, or a goat. Not a predator, a wolf, a mountain lion, or whatever, a bear, or anything like that. Only a near duff, somebody who was pursued. And that is what Reb Nelson said, I will remain. He had somebody, he, he knew the Maskilim, the Enlightenment. The heads of the Enlightenment in Russia were very friendly with Reb Nelson. They met the Rebbe when the Rebbe was still alive and they remained very strong friends with Reb Nelson. And they said to Reb Nelson, if you want, give us the word. In 24 hours, you won't have any opposition. And Reb Nelson said, God forbid that I should be the Roydev and not the Nirdav. And that was probably, I would think, the biggest Nisoyan that Reb Nelson had. I don't know for sure. I hope I'll get the chance to ask him. But uh, that's the way I'd have to analyze it. He had other problems, other difficulties, but I don't know if they stood out as much as that. <coughs> Question? Nusen, whenever the Rebbe says something, he got more das, more das. Yes. Well, we mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah. We need a very healthy. We need to be a very healthy nefesh to this, to being and told to understand when we got their own das, when we receive das. Everybody can do that. Could everybody do it? I doubt it. But you have to understand, Reb Nelson was a genius. You see it from his writings, right? To be such a genius and yet give up what you think is right in order to follow what somebody else is telling you is right is a very different story. You have to have a tremendous amount of self-confidence that you believe that what you're doing is right, even though it's not you. It's somebody else. But it's something that's meisim b'choyon. We get up in the morning and we say moidahani and we start davening. Where did that come from? Is that what you want? Or is that what you learned from others? This is how you're supposed to conduct yourself. Right? It's that same kind of mentality that you take and you use for your own life. That I heard this, I understand this is right, and I do it. Right? You give up what you would like to. I mean, most of the world, they get up in the morning, they'll maybe take a shower, maybe not. They'll wash their face, they'll brush their teeth, and they'll go sit down by breakfast to eat ham and eggs or whatever it is. That's most of the world, right? A yid is not that way, which Reb Nosson points out in one of his alochas. Patience is built into the Yiddish and the Shema. You got to get up in the morning, you got to put on towels and fill it, you got to daven. Some people learn a little bit before that. You want to go eat, finally. I mean, you're up for a couple hours, you want to eat. First, you got to wash your hands, then you got to sit down and make a moitzi. And then you can first eat, right? There's a certain kind of direction that's put into us from child-wise that we grow up with that we should be able to come and recognize Hashem and whatever it is that we're doing, right? Rav Nassim was bright enough, brilliant enough to be able to understand 
he heard these certain things from Rabbi Nachman. This man has what to tell me to what to do. And therefore, I'm willing to put aside everything, every, <coughs> every preconceived notion that I may have in order to be able to grow and avoid this Hashem. Right? It means everybody have it to a certain point and you can build it up. You can build it up, yeah. Rebbe said, I want to make from you tzaddikim like me. If he didn't have it, you couldn't make tzaddikim like him. So everybody has it. But you have to be able to know how to build it, how to receive it. Can I ask you a question? We have these preconceived, we, we grow up this way. I mean, this is our lives. Now, 150 years ago, a kid went to Cheder, right? The parents brought the kid to Cheder in the day. He sat and learned with the Rebbe, and he came home. Today, that's not enough. It's not enough. Today, we have to have report cards, right? Where did that come in? In the old days, a Rebbe taught the kids and if you didn't understand it, he taught you again and again until you understood it. Today, it doesn't matter if you go to school. You don't have to know everything. So you won't get 100. You get an 85. So what? You're an 85 student, right? Don't you know what destroyed or what is destroying the school system today? Right? You're not allowed to be yourself. You have to fit into a preconceived notion of what it means to be a student in yeshiva, right? You don't have to know everything. You don't have to know what the Rebbe taught today. Right? So you'll be a 90%, a 92%, an 86%. What difference does it make? But there's a preconceived notion when we go, we, we have children, we send them to school. Where does that come into Yiddishkeit? Right? Right? If we would all rebel, right, maybe there won't be yeshivas or schools, but the kids would learn. <laughs> the kids would learn, they'd come out of yeshiva knowing something. Right? Now, you can publicize that in the Muncie Times that I said that, and not worry about my <laughs> reputation some other time. I'm, you know, I'm not worried about it. But think about it. There's preconceived notions that this is the way it works. No, it's not the way it works. It's not. It's not. Reb Nelson was smart enough to understand that he was 22 years old. Bucky and Shas and Poiskini. Right? There's something missing in my life, and it's got to be filled. And then you wouldn't have so many kids going off the derrick. You wouldn't have all the problems that you have with drugs and uh, alcohol and other things. I was at a wedding once. There's two, it was a literature wedding, so whatever. But there were two boys there sitting opposite me at the table. And there's a bottle of Johnny Walker or whatever it was, uh, oh no, Shiva's Regal, which I never touched the stuff, right? Moch Hashem, I had a good Rebbe when I was a kid. But I never touched the stuff, I have good parents too. But these kids, one was 14, one was 16, and they're polishing off a bottle of liquor. Mishor Makrosois. Miroka Where did you see that? It's a preconceived notion that when you go to a wedding, you're allowed to drink. Right? Because I'll talk against that, right? They talk against drinking. Right? Well. <coughs> so there you go. Reb Nelson said once, he said, uh, there's a minute today in his time that a guy sleeps with a bottle of schnapps under his pillow. He wakes up and Mashiach is not here yet. He drinks again. Right? 
Reb Nelson didn't hold from that nigga. Reb Nelson held you sleep with a tillum under your pillow, maybe, or something else like that. But not that you sleep with a bottle of whiskey. But what do you have so many kids drinking today? Right? Does that belong in the Yiddish culture? No. No? What was the good? We just had Hanukkah. Did you ever think about it? It was exile. Golos. Golos Bovel. They went to Babylon. Golos Persia. Poros Modai. We are now in Golos Edoi. Right? We're spread around the whole world. What was the Golos Yovan? What was the Golos Yovan? The Jews were in Eretz Israel. Where's the exile? Right? Where's the exile? Golis, the Rebbe says, is not that we're spread out among the nations because Hashem is everywhere. Right? The Golis is when you incorporate Goyesha mentality into your thinking. Like a report card. Or like other things like that. There are certain standards that we live by. <coughs> right? Shiduchim. What goes on with Shiduchim? Someone told me recently, I mean, I just heard this recently, you have to have a resume. Did you hear these things? A resume? You give it over to us. We buy the shalom, you know. You check out the family, are they good or not good? A resume, you went to school here, you got this book. We buy the shalom, what happened to college show? I understand there's a shidduch crisis here in the States. Is it true? Yeah, I know we have it in there itself, so it uh, shouldn't be too much different here. Your body should, this is what Yiddish kind is all about. Do you eat the bottom here for the top here for the chicken? Right? Do you use a white table cloth on Shabbos? Right? Anyway, the, all the different things, the, the Goyesha mentality that has creeped into Klal Yisrael is what Golos Yovan is all about. Two days ago, we had Ches, Cheshvan. Gemara says, Talmai, Talmai, the uh, Egyptian king, was geyser on 70 tzaddikim, the shivim zakenim, they should each go into a separate room, no communication, remember there were no cell phones or faxes or anything, right, each one sitting in a separate room, translate the entire Torah into Greek. When it was translated, the Gemara says it was such a terrible tragedy that Choshech descended upon the world for three days. Okay? Gemara, right? Okay. If you learn Chumash Rashi in the beginning of Pasha's Devarim, right in the beginning, Vayichtov Moshe Satara Bar Hetev. What is Bar Hetev? <laughs> Rashi says, B'shivim Loshem. The Torah was already translated into Greek. <clears throat> so what's the big deal that Talmai ordered it to be done into Greek? He took 70 Zikanim, he separated it. The Ruach HaKodesh that our Chazal had was so great that there were certain parts that they had to change because Talmai would have destroyed the Torah otherwise. But they had to change it but they changed it, each one changed it the exact same way, right? Seventy Zikanim sat in different rooms and each one was masig that in order to translate this, that he doesn't destroy the Torah, has to be done in this way, okay? By the way, just uh, somebody once told me, uh, that's not a big miracle. Seventy Zikanim, the Ruach HaKodesh, he says, if you would have put them all in the same room and they came out with the same translation, that would be a mess. <laughs> but okay. The point is that when you're dealing, what was the big tragedy? Moshe Rabbeinu already translated the Torah to Greek. Right? The tragedy was that it was forced into Kal Yisrael by the Goy. The guy who took the Torah, he says, you will translate it so that I approve of it. 
That was the tragedy. It's when we accept the Goyish mentality and we incorporate it into Yiddishkeit, then we have all the troubles we have. That's what Rabbein Zal said, that the Golis that we're in today is a Golis, it's a state of mind. It's a state of mind. If you're with Hashem 24-7, Reb Nosem was with Hashem 24-7. The Boshem HaKodesh, the Rebbe, they were with Hashem 24-7. Yeah, they lived in Tzoros and whatnot. <coughs> but Hashem was with them all the time. They recognized this is all Miyad Hashem. Reb Nosem was very uh, strict about Reb Nachman Tolchina, especially he spoke, that anything that the, the Goyesha government decreed against the Jews, he said, it's all because of Xavier from Shemayim. It's got nothing to do with the Tsar and all that. He's just a, a tool. He's just like a stick. Hoy Ashur Shevet Api, Yishaya Hanavi says. <coughs> the main thing is that we have to take Yiddishkeit and look at Yiddishkeit the way it's supposed to be. That's what Reb Nossam felt from the Rebbe. This is what the message of Hashem is all about. And therefore, he became Reb Nossam. He was able to take anything the Rebbe said and give you an entire Torah. Kutta Moran is one volume. Kutta Alochus is eight volumes. Where did it come from? And it's all the Rebbe. You look in the halacha, Reb Nosson goes back and forth, and he comes out with incredible chidushim, right? But he always goes back to the Rebbe. And that's how he was able to do what he did. Okay? You, you described before, uh, mm -hmm. he had certain discernments, he had certain challenges, and the way he internalized everything, took what Nachman said and internalized it and he grew another. In today's generation, which has all these problems with the female, people don't even have that. And then you hear of a tzara, you hear of a, a challenge. Uh, we never, I don't know, a house burned down in Flatbush last week. Three kids, a mother died, everything. Oh, never, it's terrible, it's terrible. Where are we going for sushi tonight? People don't care anymore. How do you? Sushi, yeah. I don't either. <laughs> For me, it's a steak. Right. What, how do you take what they did then and bring it into today? True, we have these problems today. Everybody, we took on the go and we took on the report cards, and every kid has to fit into a mold. And every, so now, we're, we're living in a. There was a tzaddik who passed away a little over 200 years ago. His name was Rabbi Nachman of Breslin. He tries, he tried then, and he's trying now to give us the tools how to overcome that. When a tragedy like that happens, there's something we have to do, right? There, a few years ago, there was uh, something happened in Toronto. I forgot what it was. But one of the people there said to me the same thing you're saying now. What happens then? So we had a young tefillah, and everybody came, and everybody said to them, and they all walked home, right? Where's the Osiris? Where's the arousal to Hashem? That's what Rabbein Nassar wanted, and that's what Rabbein Nassar did in the Lakuta Alochis and the Kuti Tfilis, right? Uh, I have a couple of friends we've talked about learning the Kuti Alochis. It's not easy. It's not that hard. Rabbein Nassar's uh, language is very easy to understand. It's very easy to follow. <coughs> but among us, we discussed the fact, and I say fact, that if you sit with a Lakuti Alochis for, let's say, a half hour, 45 minutes, right, and just concentrate on those pages that you just studied, you will find that you're in a different world. You're not part of this world. You're in a different world. It takes you time to come back out of that state. Reb Nossin brings you to such a moichem de gadlitz. That's incredible, right? Uh, I'll give you a, a little different example from another side. Maybe uh, it's nearly 40 years ago, 
Nobody here looks old enough to remember back 40 years. Most of you weren't even born then. But whatever. I taught in the yeshiva, Dvar Yerushalayim. It's a yeshiva in Hanov, Baal Shuvah. And I was mashkiach there at night. I used to give shiurim during the day, and I was mashkiach for the night seder. And boys would come over and talk to me about their problems and whatnot. One guy was there. He ran away from home because he came home one day from from school and found his father hitting his mother with a hammer. You know, and there a lot of guys like that. In those days, it was the beginning of the Baltruva movement. There were other stories I can't tell you. You don't want to know from them. If you heard them, you'd flip out altogether. But, you know, you're a mashkiach, so you become a confidant, and uh, people tell you some of the most miserable and disgusting and horrible things that happened in their lives. And you speak to the boys. Most of them didn't have such a terrible, but there were quite a few. There was one kid, his mother died in childbirth with his younger brother. He was two years old, so he never went out of the house. The father allowed it to happen. And um, he was like 25 years old. When he was then first, his father sent him to Israel. He should go to psychologists and whatnot. Whatever. I mean, uh, horrible stories what happened to people. <clears throat> so you can only talk to the boys so much. You can only explain to them so much. What I would do after a while of knowing this boy and knowing how far he can go, I would bring him over to the bookshelf in the base medrash, and I'd show him a set of Lukuti Halachis. And I would say, here, eight volumes from Reb Nossam of Breslau. Pick any volume you want. Okay, they choose any volume. Then I tell them, now open up to any page you want. Not that I'm doing anything. You do. You pick out the page that you want. <laughs> they pick out the page. I said, now point to any paragraph you want. They point to a paragraph. I said, okay, let's go sit down and study. We would sit down and study that paragraph. And then I would look at the kid, and I would tell him, tell me if that paragraph wasn't written for you or not. Doesn't that paragraph cover all the things that you were just talking to me about before? Do you hear that? You understand what's in the page of Kuti <coughs> I'm sorry. You understand, you know what's on a page of Kuti Aloha's, that you can open up anywhere and you can find something that will talk to you and tell you how to get through this little problem. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Try it. You'll like it. Try it. It'll work. You'll see. And I didn't do it only once. It's several times, with several of the boys. <coughs> you didn't need it. <laughs> but uh, you may need it now, but you didn't need it. Now. Anyway, whatever it is, these are things that Rav Nossam did. The greatness of Rav Nossam was because he set himself aside from whoever he was to become the student of the Rebbe. Wow. Yeah, look at that. Look at this service. Rebbe, buddy, you should have a big Yeshua for everything that you need. Look at that. Anyone here of Moshe Kramer? A big breast of her. And he's not related to me, so you don't have to worry. But uh, he's one of the big leaders in the breast of movement in Eretz so We were talking once about illness 
and uh, we're talking of the powers of tea. Tea can really help anybody. Everybody uses tea. Tea. So he said, tea is only good. It's only effective if you put a pill inside it. You have to put a pill inside the tea in order for it to become effective. Right? This is how aggressive a chosen tea is. Because in Hebrew, how do you say tea? Tay, right? Tough and hay. And how do you say pill in Hebrew? Pill. Pay your lamed. If you take pay your lamed and put it inside tough and hay, you have tefillin. That's how a breast of a chosen takes. And that's because of Rav Nosson. Okay. <coughs> Because of the Rebbe, naturally, but that's how we think. Right? Good, huh? <laughs> so now you can always drink tea. Any questions? Huh? Did he say anything? No. Well, Kavli is called Kavli Al Hashem. It's sort of matter. <laughs> Any questions? Anything about Rabbi? We'll get some more questions. Just take a break. Have some tefillah. Tea. No, no, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> there's quite a few that are just mind boggling. Tfilin Aloha A. Tfilin? Aloha A. Okay. Or Matona Aloha A. Or Arayv Aloha Gimel. Or uh, Rebus Hay. These are long halachas. They're so powerful. I just want to start somewhere. I know the beginning is always the best place to start. I just want something to give a strong, like, ignition. Try Orev Halacha Gimel. It's a Chesh Mishbech Chen of Zion. Mishbech Mishbech Chen Kalaf. Also, I wanted to know. I my father wants to know if he could see you, um, Shia Rapper. Yeah, I just got on my schedule. Do you, um, do you know where you're staying for Shabbos? Yes. Are you staying by the Saffrons? Do you know his family? Um, is there any like time or place tomorrow that he might be able to? Okay. Possible. Is there. Can you like, um, maybe I greet you on the phone or something? Or. I think I might have taken it over last time. But, uh,
Take your number? Yeah.